My father uh, in no way endorsed sports. He thought it was an absolute waste of time. And he never went to a ball game. He never talked about a ball game. He never asked how I was doing. With the Houston Chronicle on the table and my picture on the page, he never asked about it. He detested it. He thought it was a worldly process and that I should not be involved in it at all. That was a legalistic mindset that if it was fun, is bound to be sin. And uh, I just didn't buy into it. I didn't then, I don't now. I, I told my mother, I said, when I'm 18 years of age, you'd get a photograph and take of my rear end going through that door because I'm never coming back and I'll never walk through the door of a church house again. And she really knew that I really meant it. And I did mean it. To the core of my being, I meant it. And she got a group of, prayer, uh, uh, of ladies together, a prayer group, and uh, they, they met uh, at the church on a regular basis to pray for my salvation. Four months later, here came an envelope with a gold lettering at the top left from the offices of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And it was an appointment to West Point. And I, I really felt liberated because I knew I had a way out. I was sitting on the back seat of my father's church uh, with a mechanical drawing board on my lap working quadratic equations and uh, I got that done and put it in my briefcase and stood up and waited for the evangelist to shut up so I could go home because that was the agreement that I had to stay in the church until the service was over. Something akin to Paul on the road to Damascus. There was an instantaneous desire to know the will of God for my life. I went forward and I just knelt down and prayed a simple prayer. I said, Lord, I really do want to do what you want to do with my life. And if going to West Point is that thing, then I'm good with it. But if you truly want me involved in the ministry of the church, you have to change. I want you to change my mind and my heart. This is, this is the Bible my dad's church gave to me. Where'd you find this? I've had it. You we, have it at we, home? We've been... it's, in my, it's in my office. Okay. This is to Johnny Hagee from the Friends of First Assembly. Uh, I wrote that this Bible is presented to me at the going away party January 24th before my departure to Southwestern Bible Institute. The party was held at Brother Taylor's house on a Friday night. The following Sunday, I left for school to fulfill the will of God upon my life. I preached out of this book and I wore this book out. First church was the Trinity Church in the 2900 block of Nacogdoches Road. The second church was the Four Winds Church uh, just at the edge of Windcrest. 
The third church was the Church of Castle Hills on Loop 410, and the fourth church is Cornerstone. I started investigating from people who would have a knowledge of the growth pattern of this city, which way the town was going to move. And everyone I talked to said, this city for the next 40, 50 years is gonna go north between San Pedro, which is 281, and I-10. And I followed San Pedro up to Charles Anderson Loop. And I, I turned left, I said, I want the first corner that comes off this loop. And I saw a little fine line that looked like a goat trail. I said, what is that? He said, someday that will be called Stone Oak Parkway. When I was a kid, I remember coming here for 4th of July church picnics and, and play days. And, uh, you know, we had a large flatbed trailer that we would have different uh, musicians and, and singers from the church perform on and just kind of a, an all day sing fest with watermelon eating contests and flag football games. And obviously looking back, pastor's purpose in doing that was that he wanted people to associate themselves in, in receiving you know ministry and fellowship there it had been reported that pastor Hagee was building the largest building i think in san antonio at that time needless to say would the people come and so that was extremely extremely critical to the mood that would be set for the future when we walked into the building and saw it full to overflowing. And then the report that came from the sheriff that there was miles of cars that had to be turned away. We just held each other and thanked the Lord for his goodness. Ready? I hope I am. The first time I walked to the platform on the dedication day of Cornerstone Church was one of the greatest days of my life. In your 65 years of ministry here in the city of San Antonio, uh, you've been a part of several church campuses. And the church here at Cornerstone that was opened in 1987 has been renovated. What do you think about your teaching wall? You know, your mother, no. your mother started with bed sheets that she was hand drawing no. and, and you had graphic designers no. put your images on canvas, yeah. now we can animate them. What do you think about that? Uh, what he's talking about, my mother, she was a great Bible teacher, and she would build a frame, much like the frames you see here, and take bed sheets and sew them, and she would have a chart that would be 18 feet long and, and at the height of, uh, well, seven or eight feet, and. Um, she would teach ages and dispensations. And let me tell you, brother, it was extremely attractive. People would pack into that church to hear her teach that because it was visual. They could see it. The, the ability to put what you're preaching in a very visible, visual way uh, is just remarkable. It's... <laughs> Jesus would like to have had that. <laughs> <laughs> he could make fish and loaves multiply. He wanted a video camera to watch it. It. it is it is fantastic. The essence of the sermon that you're preaching are right there. And the pictures dramatize the moment that you're talking about because the sermon manuscript matches what's happening on the screen. It's just way, way above 
uh, what uh, people are accustomed to when they go to the average church. And it again validates your mission, all the gospel to all the world and to every generation. For generations to come, people will sit in that sanctuary and knew that there was a visionary who was serious about what God asked him to do. Congratulations on 65 years of ministry. Well, thank you for being a part of it, son. And uh, uh, well, five years ago, when I made you the lead pastor, which means you have the responsibility of making the decisions that govern the uh, employees. We have over 700 employees, and uh, you're doing a masterful work of that. You're your uh, sermons in the pulpit are just uh, uh, par excellence. They are fabulous in content, and uh, people all over the nation are recognizing the quality of your ministry, and I couldn't be more proud of you. I gotta work hard, Daddy's watching. And I'm very well pleased. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, son. Since the beginning of creation, God has sought out people of extraordinary faith and devotion. As a young man, I surrendered to the Lord's call and have served his will for 65 years, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world and to every generation. For your gift of any amount to Hagee Ministries, we will send you a unique 65 years of ministry coin commemorating Pastor Hagee's remarkable service. For your gift of $165 or more, we will also send you a decorative tile with the prayer made at the dedication of Cornerstone Church and a Born to be Blessed booklet. As we celebrate 65 years in ministry, we give all glory to God Almighty, and we thank you, our friends and partners, for your continued support of Hagee Ministries. To receive these gifts, call the number on your screen or visit jhm.org devotion. You can live life without limit because God lives in you and God has all power in heaven and on earth. Give him praise and glory. And I've always prayed the prayer, said, God, if there's anything you want me to do to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, I, I'm willing and I'm ready to do it. And in those moments of intercessory prayer that I are always by myself, uh, there, there will come into my mind and into my spirit the thing that I believe that God wants us to do. And once I get settled on that, uh, you just lock down on it and get it done. There was a moving company and it was called Global Moving Lines or Global Something. And he saw that word global and he thought that's what the name of this ministry will be, Global Evangelism. From uh, the late 70s until the 90s, uh, we were on television every Sunday preaching to uh, America and had a strong listening audience. That's where God taught me the TV business. We put the signal up and the phone started ringing. People wanted a tape. We had to start a tape ministry. People wanted the books. We had to start a book ministry. Uh, people wanted to become partners. We had to start a partnership group. Right now, when you get on the platform of Cornerstone Church and you look at those seven television cameras, there's not a place on the planet that's not receiving the signal that can receive a signal. More than five years ago, when we went to the Jewish community for the very first time and said we would like to have a night to honor Israel, and it was something of an astounding concept, and in the finest Jewish tradition, they called a committee meeting. <laughs> and then another one. <laughs> and it was at this committee meeting that Rabbi Scheinberg pushed the ball across the line and said, they have extended their hands to us 
Now let's extend our hands back toward them. Without him, a night to honor Israel very likely would never have happened for the very first time. That night, there was no attempt in any way to proselytize. There was no attempt to denigrate. There was no attempt to, to other than to praise and love. And that was rather new to the Jewish people. I was able to say to everyone there, let's give this person a chance. We know how to deal with our enemies, but what if this person's a friend? We stood for the benediction. Rabbi Scheinberg gave the benediction. The security guy came out and said, this building's supposed to blow up in five minutes. I intended to do a night to honor Israel one time, but that's the moment that it just was the bridge too far. That ripped it. So as we walked off the platform, I told Diana, we're going to do this every year until these anti-Semitic rednecks get used to this. We did it the next year, and we did it the third year at the church, and it got bigger and bigger, and we put it on TV, and it began to spread across the nation. These participating pastors of Tulsa have come tonight to say that we would like to look over the fences that have divided us for centuries, and we would like to extend our hands to you in brotherhood, and let us announce to this war-torn world that the love of God is alive and well in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Christians United for Israel took off. He didn't know if the Christian world was ready um, because he was asking for quite a lot to just kind of leave any other disagreements, you know, aside and, and move forward with one voice. There have been hundreds and thousands of Night to Honor Israels across the nation and other churches. And John Hagee Ministries uh, alone has donated over a hundred million dollars directly to Israeli humanitarian causes. And it's the largest pro-Israel grassroots organization in the world. And um, not just a number, but also strength. In 2017, Pastor had the privilege of having the audience with the president to specifically discuss the biblical significance of the embassy being moved to Jerusalem. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Today, I am delivering. I've judged this course of action to be in the best interests of the United States of America and the pursuit of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Being in Israel for the embassy dedication was nothing short of miraculous. To watch Pastor Hagee give the benediction, to pray the blessing over that sacred ground was the honor of a lifetime. As King David prayed 3,000 years ago, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all its inhabitants. Let the name of the Lord be glorified today for the defender of Israel today, tomorrow, and forever is here. Can we all shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. God's blessing to honor him, pastor, not for his own glory, but for the glory of God and for the work that he's done and for all of the, the members of CUFI, for all of the participants in Knights to Honor Israel, for all of the congregants of Cornerstone Church and John Hagee Ministries. Um, everybody was there that day. There's a thinking in Jewish theology that God doesn't perform miracles only because we deserve them but because we need them. I, I think the world needed pastor at this moment. I think the Jewish people needed pastor at this moment. 
So that's the miracle. And we, I don't know if we deserved it, but we sure as heck needed it. This is Cornerstone. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stand up and to hold the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ that the world may see him. God has made it possible for us to reach the nations of the world in every language that we can get it translated in. He is the way, the truth, and the life for all of the world. We are saving the world one life at a time. In Judaism, there's a saying, he who saves one life saves the world. Cornerstone Church is God's church. It was built for the next generation. Tens of thousands have come to know Christ, and the harvest field is greater than ever before. The latter years are going to be greater than the former years, for the best is yet to be. Honor Pastor Hagen's 65 years of ministry and go to jhm.org slash 65 years. Sanctuary of Hope is now operating. It's now changing lives. Girls are there. Babies are being born. Young ladies who thought they had no choice are finding out they've got a life filled with potential and options. Uh, considering what that work has meant to you throughout your years of ministry, the desire that you had to open an orphanage early and, and be involved in that kind of work, uh, what kind of fulfillment do you feel when you see the Sanctuary of Hope? We have built what, in my opinion, is probably the premier environment in America for young ladies to go and have a child who are pregnant and are not married, and they want to have the opportunity to have their child. That child can be adopted out at birth, or that child can be raised uh, at Sanctuary of Hope. The mother and the child can live together. The mother can continue to go to school. And uh, we have educational programs for the mother. Uh, we have 85 acres there. And the passion of my soul is to drive down that main boulevard that we have leading up to the main house and seeing children from fence to fence. Now I know that's... <laughs> That's going to be a lot of I know of that's a migraine headache for the administrators. But they got a, Tylenol. There's an ocean of need, and we have the facility to accommodate. And so I say, let's do it, because every life matters to God. Every life matters. Sixty-five million children have been murdered in this country through abortion and we are saving just a few, but we are doing every day all we can do to do more. God knows we are trying our very best. So the battle for the life of the unborn still rages. It is far from over. The Sanctuary of Hope has the potential to save hundreds of lives mm -hmm. and change the destiny of millions in the future when you consider the generational impact that that property has the potential to create. Uh, many people, obviously, uh, in the last administration, um, were celebrating the fact that judges were put into place on the Supreme Court to reverse the federal ruling of Roe versus Wade. But what I think is important is so many individuals do not understand that that battle is not over. Roe yeah. versus Wade has been overturned, but the abortion fight is still front and center. Absolutely. Jesus said that one soul is worth more than all the wealth of the world. I'm sorry. And so, winning souls is the most important thing in the world. I know you had an ambition to be a football player, 
and you could have made it. You were invited to be a football coach and you refused it to stay in the ministry. But God has helped you to, uh, to reach souls. And when you get to heaven, eternity, it's going to, it's going to pay off because uh, Jesus said, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, it profiteth nothing. That's what's so incredibly special about him. He is just so grateful to be a child of God that he doesn't realize the influence that he carries. And why does he carry that influence? Because of the life that he's led. And is there one word, maybe two or three, uh, perseverance, faith, and integrity. My husband is a man of integrity. And in that respect, he is like my mother-in-law. They preach the word, they teach the word, and they live the word. Look, there are people that read history, people that write history, and people that make history. I mean, he, he has changed the world. Everything that I have tried to do, especially early on, there was a cadre of people that were shouting, this simply cannot be done. It is beyond our grasp. It's beyond our reach. You have to recognize your limitations. And I do recognize my limitations, but I have never limited the God that I serve. I will retire when they shove me out the front door in a pine box. Uh, until then, I, I intend to work every day of my life in a meaningful direction to advance the kingdom of God. I see Dad walking into a season where he's gonna get to speak into the lives of young leaders. He's gonna get to speak uh, words of wisdom and truth to people who desperately need answers in an hour of need. And I'm looking forward to seeing his fingerprints left on a generation of pastors that he might not have even met yet. Sunday after Sunday, month after month, year after year, building program after building program, death threat after death threat, uh, controversy after controversy. God has been a faithful God. He's always made a way when there seemed to be no way. And there is no such thing as being in a situation that's impossible with the Lord. We are just mere shadows and dust that pass across the stage of history. But God Almighty is the architect of the beauty of all that we see.